Chris, thank you for joining us for World Carnivorous Plant Day from England. My name is Charlie and I'm a middle school student in the United States. Can you tell us why you're interested in carnivorous plants? Sure, Charlie. So um, I've always been interested in carnivorous plants ever since, since I was a kid and I used to grow them in my bedroom. And I think the reason that, that I'm still fascinated with them today is that they really challenge our notion of what a plant is. When you ask people what they think of when they think about plants, they think about perhaps something beautiful, something quite passive that maybe forms a sort of backdrop, things we grow in our homes, things we grow in our gardens. And actually with carnivorous plants, they challenge that notion completely because here are effectively plant predators. They've, they've turned the tables on animals because these are plants that can in a way hunt. Um, and I think that's really, really fascinating. And it can be a way of drawing people in to think about plants and talk about plants in, in a different way. Uh, my name is Sandro and I'm from uh, Lebanon, but I'm currently studying in uh, the US. Hi Sandro. Can you describe your favorite encounter with a carnivorous plant for us, please? Yeah, yeah, I can, Sandra. So um, I had a, a lifelong fascination for the island of Borneo um, because as a, as a kid, I used to read books about it. And I thought, gosh, this is an amazing place where all these incredible plants grow there. And I had this dream about climbing Mount Kinabalu, which is in the north of Borneo, the Malaysian part. And when I was in my early 20s, that dream came true and I got to climb that, that special mountain. I spent some time there looking at all the wonderful pitcher plants that grow there. And there's one in particular that you may know because it's famously the largest um, pitcher plant, Nepenthes raja. And that grows on a particular slope around, well, it grows in a few places, but there was a slope that was the, the easiest place to go and see it. And there was this wonderful steep, um, slope on the mountain formed by an old landslide with the sound of a, a waterfall somewhere in the distance below and all these monstrous giant looking pitcher plants all around me and that's an experience that i'll i'll never forget thank you um, i know that carnivorous plants get nutrients from the prey they capture but still require lots of sunlight can you please explain that photosynthesis in carnivorous plants like nepenthes is important Sure, that, that's a, a great question. And, and I've grown Nepenthes all my life. And, and when people ask me for tips on how to grow them, at least here in, in the UK, there are, there are two things that I often mention. One is around humidity. These plants love to have very humid conditions to, to pitcher well. And the other one is around light. And perhaps when people think of tropical areas, they don't necessarily think of, of a high intensity of sunlight. But these plants do need quite a lot of light. And the reason is this. When we think about normal leaves and we think about how they function and what they do for a plant, they're a little bit like solar panels for the plant and they harvest energy for it. And if you think about a typical leaf, it's often quite flat and it's oriented in a way that can capture sunlight. And then when we think about a carnivorous plant, they're often not like a normal leaf. So they're not necessarily flat or oriented um, particularly well to capture sunlight. And they're often not even colored very green. And, and so that begs the question, are these leaves, because traps in carnivorous plants are leaves, are they good at harvesting light? And the answer is often no, because something that acts effectively as an insect trap doesn't necessarily function well as a light trap. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off going on for the plant. And if it's going to invest all of this energy in producing um, these leaves that trap insects, um, that takes quite a lot of effort for, for the plant. And so how does it um, square off that, that trade-off between nutrients from insects versus light capture? Um, and, and so what happens here is that the nutrients from the, the insects that the plant is capturing, these nutrients are, you could say, channeled into other areas of the plant. So if you think of an Apenthes pitcher plant, it has those green leaf-like lamina um, that you've, you've probably seen. And these parts are quite effective at photosynthesizing. And so by funneling the nutrients from the insects it's caught into those structures, um, the, the plant is able to, to, to grow well despite that trade-off. But in order for it to do this, it does need a lot of light to begin with. So, so to coming back to your question, why do they need a lot of light? In, in simple English, carnivorous plants produce leafy traps that are good for catching insects but they're not good for catching light and so for that reason they need to grow in an area where there's a lot of light already does that make sense yeah do you grow highland or lowland nepenthes 
So great, great question. And um, I work at Oxford Botanic Garden and we grow quite a few of both. Um, but sadly, we don't have the best conditions to be able to, to grow them all at the temperatures that they want. And so we tend to grow a lot of them side by side. And what that means is that some of them do well at different times of, of the year, but we do grow both. I mean, I, I have a preference for Highland Nepenthes. I, I really love the, the, the mountain species. They're, they're my favorites, personally. Thank you. Nepenthes trap their food using a pit bull trap, where the animal falls into the liquid and can get out. What, what else have you learned about the pitchers? So, Sandra, I think there are more questions than answers, really, uh, about pitcher plants. And I guess about sort of 20, 30 years ago, when people thought of pitcher plants, they thought of them as relatively simple, leafy pitfall traps that insects just sort of tumble into and they drown and, and they provide nutrients to the plants. And actually what's become clear is that the more scientists have looked at these astonishing plants, the more discoveries have been made and, and have challenged that view that they just sort of sit there and wait for prey to fall in. Um, so there are plants that capture termites specifically that, that attract them. Um, there are pitcher plants that have, as you probably know, a layer of wax in them that clogs up insects' feet so they can't climb out. And some have uh, fluid inside that we call viscoelastic, so it's a bit sticky like honey. And if an insect tries to escape, it drags the insect back, back down into the trap. But in truth, of the 170 or so species of Nepenthes um, that have been described, really the prey that they capture in, in many cases in the wild is actually a mystery and no one's really um, looked in, in great detail. So there are lots of discoveries still to make, that's for sure. Nepenthes are very diverse. Some are small, some have fangs, and others are large enough to drown a rat. What have you learned about these plants and how these plants evolved into the diversity of species we see today? Thanks, that's, that's a great question. And, and I'd say that the more we examine these plants, the more we find out. Um, so there are pitcher plants that flick insects into their traps during rainstorms. There are those that form compost, composting bins where leaf litter falls into them. There are tree shrew toilets you might know about, so little creatures that climb onto the traps and, and they leave their droppings behind, um, and bat roosting shelters. And these are just the ones that we've looked at in, in detail. And to your question, there's an extraordinary diversity of pitcher plants. So if you looked at all the different forms that have been described side by side, you'd notice all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And so uh, an evolutionary biologist would ask, why are there these different forms of pitcher plant if they're all attracting and doing the same thing, you know, attracting insects that fall in? And the answer is that the, the ones we've looked at, at least, that isn't necessarily the case. Um, there's a, there's a, a variety of different food sources that these pitcher plants are tapping into. And it seems that as over evolutionary time, these pitcher plants have filled different habitats, whether it's in sort of um, hot, humid swamps or cool, misty mountain sites, they've adapted to the different nutrient sources that might be available to them. So if you're a plant that's growing in a closed canopy forest, it might make sense for you to produce leaf litter bins like Nepenthes ampullaria. Or if you're a big pitcher plant that grows on a, a cool hillside where there might not be many insects, but there are lots of tree shrews scampering around, it might make sense to produce these tree shrew toilets, these big sturdy traps that animals can sit on and, and their droppings can fall in. And as every good gardener knows, manure is good for a plant and effectively that, that's what the plant is, is consuming. And so um, with new species discovered every year, um, we don't actually even know what, what many of them are, are feeding on and no one's looked in detail at, at what the different prey are that fall into these traps. And so there are lots of um, mysteries still to be solved, I think, in, in the Pempe. So it's very exciting. Why should people celebrate carnivorous plants? Why should people celebrate carnivorous plants? I, I, um, what, what a great question. I think the, the reason I think we should, we should celebrate them is that they are what I think of as botanical enigmas. So every time we look closely at new species of carnivorous plants, we make new discoveries and many of them are astonishing. And we haven't even discovered all of the carnivorous plants there are. There are still plants waiting to be discovered out there in the world. Um, and certainly there are many discoveries still to come. So we really need to celebrate these extraordinary plants um, for the botanical enigmas that they are. Thank you for joining us on World Carnivorous Plants. You're welcome. Um, one last question. Sure. Um, could you share some details about the drawings that you've made about carnivorous plants? 
Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm a, a botanist first and foremost. So, uh, so I'm, I'm a scientist and, and I love to solve mysteries about how plants evolved. Um, but I also love to draw them. And lots of biologists and botanists love to draw because it's a way that you can really examine a plant closely and, and get to know it and, um, and, and to visualize it. So I've, um, I've always thought that drawing and biology and botany go hand in hand. And certainly I've always drawn and sketched ever since I was a, a kid. And um, luckily for me, uh, I always wanted to be a botanist and, and that's what I grew up to be. And so I very much enjoy uh, sketching and, and painting carnivorous plants. And it's also a way for me to revive some of those wonderful experiences I've had in the past. So I've been very lucky to see some extraordinary plants in some beautiful places around the world. And when I come home, I love nothing more than to be able to paint them and then recreate some of those experiences in paint. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome.